So hello and welcome. I'm Connor Williams. I'm a senior researcher here in the Early Education Initiative at New America. Uh, I'm also the father of a two and a half year old who's about to enter DCPS in the fall. So this is a book, um, Our School by Sam Shultain, which is for sale right there. Uh, that it came right on time for me. We, we've just gone through the unified lottery process. We've been thinking about this as a family a lot. It's been an interesting confluence of my personal life and my professional life. Uh, it was exactly what I needed to because, you know, we were going to the, the, the open houses. We were having these tortured conversations on playgrounds with, with other parents as, and, and about the you know, ways of keeping up with the Joneses by gaming various lottery systems. And, and were you doing enough for your kid? Well, I, I didn't know. Uh, and so then I, I came across Sam's book, and there are many things about education writing uh, that Sam does well, but, but the thing that this book does best of all is it's, it's obviously a pursuit of clarity. This is not a book to confirm your ideological biases. It's not a book to make it simple uh, to think about school choice or charter schools or about how neighborhoods are, are connected to the schools that are within them. This is a book that's about presenting a clear picture. And if you're not familiar with it, uh, here's the general uh, idea. Sam spent a year in two DC elementary schools, one district, one charter. And as I can tell, he can confirm this for you, it was a case study just to show what it's like in a district uh, school right now in Washington, DC, and what it's like to start up a charter here in DC. There wasn't a lot of ideological freight being carried. This wasn't uh, to make some sweeping and very simple generalization about whether charters work or charters don't. It's not about whether they are the angels to save public education or whether they're a demonic pox on public education. It was a clear book. It is a clear book. And that virtue comes again with, with a sort of discomfort uh, as part of it. It's not a book that's going to make you, uh, make your, your thoughts on charter schools easy. So with that in mind, uh, this event, I think, is, is an, it's not a book event insofar as we're trying to tell you what's in the book, but this is a, a book event that's designed to cash the check or start cashing the check that Sam wrote in that book, which is to say we're here to have a more thorough and a more thoughtful conversation about school choice here in D.C. based on some of the things that he's written, based on some of the experiences that we've, this really distinguished panel we have has had, uh, and to get towards a, a better vision for, for DC that works for everyone. And the one that's uh, balancing the value of choice with virtues like neighborhood community, educational equity, uh, and hopefully success for all students. So with that in mind, uh, there are a lot of things, as, as most of you know, to think about in terms of school choice in Washington, DC. There's, uh, we have rapid gentrification going on here. We have uh, shifting school boundaries, perhaps, in the next year or so. We have all sorts of uh, complicated issues around a diversity that are racial, that are ethnic, that are socioeconomic, that are in so many ways uh, very interesting. All this and more is coming for you in our panel. It's going to be moderated by an outstanding moderator, uh, covers public schools here in DC for the Washington Post, this is Emma Brown. So I hope you'll join me in enjoying this panel and in welcoming me here with a uh, round of applause. Thank you, Connor, and thank you all for coming for what I think is going to be a really timely conversation with a, a great group of folks. Um, so before I introduce uh, the panelists today, I want to take a minute to just set the stage a little bit with a few numbers um, about DC. So here in DC, 44% of our public school students are in charter schools, which is huge when you look across the country. Only two uh, cities have a greater percentage of kids in charter schools, but it's not just charter schools that have given families choices. DCPS, um, our public school system, more than half of students in the school system aren't going to the school they're assigned to. So when you look out across the district, you've got only about a quarter of students who are going to the school that they are assigned to, the school down the block, um, the way that we think about it. And so that's, there's, a, there's a sort of scattering that happens. And, um, Abigail Smith, the Deputy Mayor for Education, has her team recently put out some pretty incredible data that shows what that scattering looks like in our neighborhoods. So for example, there's a, a neighborhood uh, east of the river around Aton Elementary School. That attendant zone has somewhere around 550 students. 
Um, only about 150 of them actually go to Eitan, the school they're assigned to. And the other 400 kids go to 83 different schools across the city, public and public charter schools. So um, it, and Eitan is not really even all that weird. Um, the average, if you look at one attendance zone, is 64 different schools. So, so that's kind of the reality in which we're having this conversation today, that it, in which the city has had sort of a long, a long simmering debate, if you will, about what that means for neighborhoods and communities. And that debate was kind of blown up in a few weeks ago uh, to a, an even broader and um, more intense discussion when um, Abigail Smith released some proposals for not just overhauling school boundaries, which is anybody who's been around education knows is like already sort of a third rail, but, um, but also changing the way students are assigned to schools. Um, and so, and those range from sort of tweaking the system we have now to, to really fundamentally uh, changing it in a way that, you know, neighborhood schools as, as we think about them wouldn't necessarily exist anymore and so if, if in some cases given the proposal. So here, that's the context in which we're talking and I think people around the city have been talking about so, many, so much of what we're going to be discussing today, um, including how and whether choice is a strategy for improving DC schools, about the value of neighborhood schools and the tension in a segregated city between um, neighborhood schools and diverse schools, and about whether school choice is even really a fair term, uh, given, given what some parents call school chance, the, the low cho chances you'll get into that really sought after school. So with that, here's some introductions. Um, at the end, is Sam Chaltain, and we'll come back to you, Sam. Um, Abigail Smith is <laughs> sitting next to him. She is the city's deputy mayor for education, as I said, um, and has taken the lead role on the student assignment proposals and other, other initiatives that I bet will come up today, like our common lottery for, for charter and uh, tr traditional schools. She started her career at Teach for America and was there for a dozen years before coming to DCPS, um, first under Chancellor Michelle Rhee and then under uh, Chancellor Kaya Henderson as the Chief of Transformation um, with a bunch of issues in her portfolio. portfolio. Uh, immediately before coming to the Gray Administration last year, she was an independent consultant and chair of the board at E.L. Haynes Public Charter School. Sitting next to her is Laura Moser. Laura is a writer and a parent of two young children who lives in Northeast Washington. She uh, had a recent piece in Washingtonian Magazine entitled How Not to Get Your Kid into Kindergarten. Um, which I think was echoed so much of what I hear from parents when I, when I talk with them about what it's li like to go through the, the ritual of the lottery here in DC. Um, she's a former editor at Harville Press in London and now is a regular contributor to the Wall Street Journal's off-duty section, but her writing has appeared in a whole bunch of other publications, um, including the New York Times and Slate, and on top of that she's written the biography of Betty Davis. Um, Sitting next to her is Scott Pearson, who's the deputy, I'm sorry, executive director of the DC Public Charter School Board, uh, <coughs> the entity here in DC that authorizes new charter schools and closes those um, that aren't meeting their accountability measures. Um, Scott had a long career in business at America Online and Bain and Company, has also worked in federal government, including as a um, trade uh, negotiator for the Clinton administration and more recently for the Obama administration in the education department um, as a deputy in the Office of Innovation and Improvement. And Evelyn Boyd Simmons, to my right, has lived in DC for 32 years. She is known in her neighborhood in Logan Circle as a force uh, and community organizer. She's also the mother of two DCPS students, um, chairs the education committee for her local advisory neighborhood commission, and is a founding member of the <coughs> Ward 2 Education Network, a group of activists who have come together to make their voices heard in citywide debates about schools. Um, Evelyn's professional background ranges from volunteering in Senegal to working for the U.S. Senate and State Department and Fortune 100 companies. These days she also does occasional consulting for individuals and organizations. Finally, Sam, all the way at the end, is a former high school teacher who translated his interest in education to a career as a writer and strategic communications consultant. Um, he previously worked as a national director for the Forum on Education and Democracy, an, an education advocacy organization, and he was the founding director of the Five Freedoms Project, a national program that helps K-12 educators create more democratic learning communities. His writing has appeared in the Washington Post and Ed Week and USA Today, and of course in the book we're here to talk about. 
um, for which Sam did what a lot of education reporters wish they could do and do not do, which is spend a lot of time, sustained time, in the same school, in the same classroom, in Sam's case, two, two classrooms. Um, and so without further, further ado, Sam, what, can you talk before, you, before we read from the book, what were you setting out to do in this book? Sure, thanks Emma, and hi everybody. Um, thank you all for coming. I, I think I, I set out uh, with both selfless and selfish reasons for writing this book, and the selfless part I don't know that I could put it any better than Connor. So Connor is really nice to hear the way that you framed it because my hope was to tell a story that would help us at least start to pivot away from the current tenor of most conversations about school reform, which if you're here, you're probably interested in conversations about school reform and so you know that they're usually very contentious and two-dimensional. So the first thing you have to do is pick your side. Are you for or against the unions? Are you for or against Teach for America? Are you for or against school choice? And for any of us that have worked in and with schools, you know that it's more complicated than that. So the, the selfless thing that I set out to do was try to put a human face on the modern landscape of school reform as seen, it's not even really through two schools. As, as Emma says, it's really two classrooms. It's a kindergarten classroom in a then first year charter school, Mundo Verde, and a third grade classroom of a 90-year-old neighborhood school in Mount Pleasant, Bancroft Elementary. And so my hope was exactly that we would be able to start to have conversations like this that take the, those stories as a jumping off point for larger questions. Um, and then it was selfish because, um, as, as Emma said, I started my career as a teacher in New York City. Um, I was the statistic, I taught for five years and then I, I, I left and I've been in education my whole career, but um, I've been very lucky in that I get to work uh, with and, and in schools all around the country, so I, I get to see a lot of schools, I get to be in them. But it had been a while since I had really been embedded in a school, been deeply invested. And, and so I felt like as somebody that tries to be uh, public voice and advocate on issues of schooling, I needed to, to get my hands dirty again and really experience over the course of an entire school year, what is it like to be a teacher in a startup charter school environment? What is it like to teach third grade in a city um, that has a new teacher evaluation system and that's a part of the larger movement towards test-based accountability? And what's it like to be a parent who's trying to negotiate this brave new world for the first time and, and make a, a choice about a school when so much of the information that we have about schooling is still so incomplete. So that was the main thing that, that I set out to do and what's exciting about the book being out is now it's for the, the rest of you to tell me to what extent I was um, successful and um, in the places where I stumbled, uh, where and why, and I hope you will. And what, I mean, you, you spent all that time there, you talked to, there was a lot in your book about teaching and how very hard teaching is, and I think anyone who has been a teacher, known a teacher, or watched a teacher can relate. But what, can you talk a little bit about what you learned, um, with particular eye towards this world of choice that we live in, and um, you, you very explicitly wrote that you didn't go in looking to compare charter schools and traditional schools, but I'm curious what, what lessons you came away with um, about those two different worlds. Sure, so the, the first thing, it really was confirmed for me that um, still uh, teaching is um, heroic, underappreciated, and largely unsustainable work. It is almost impossible to be a really effective teacher who is still able to nourish the personal sides of themselves in the current climate. And part of that is because we're still perfecting our ability to succeed in a system that no longer serves our interests. But part of it is also because we're in the midst of the largest paradigm shift in what it means to be a teacher in 100 years. And the simplest way to put it is, um, for almost everybody in this room, when we were students, uh, the expectation was that we needed to adjust to the needs and the norms of the school. And now the expectation is that the school must adjust to the needs and the norms of each student. And personally, I think that's right. 
I think that's the way we should be going. And it's a lot harder to do <laughs> as a teacher. So there's this, um, there's a capacity gap for almost everybody in the field, whether you're a first year or a third year teacher. Um, the expectation is that you will be differentiating your instruction to each and every student 180 days a year, six hours a day, five days a week. Um, but the preparation that most uh, professional teachers have received is not fully in line with that. And so when you read the book, you'll see that uh, there's really four teachers that I spent time with, and uh, the two principals of the schools were also former teachers. And everyone describes these experiences of going home at night and having to basically construct your own crash course in all the things that you need to know in order to meet the needs of your kids that you'd never learned before. So that's a problem, and it's something we all have to wrestle with, and the chance to wrestle with it in conversations like this is really important. The last thing to your point about choice, so to me what's interesting is, as Connor said, I, I'm, I'm not out to, um, to, to speak purely for or against either traditional districts or charter schools. Um, I think there's clear values to both, but what was interesting to me was seeing that in a way, the primary strength of each sector is what the other sector is most in need of. So, Charter schools, by definition, are kind of making it all up as they go. And sure enough, in Mundo Verdi's first year, you see the excitement and the insanity of that, of having to construct your professional development calendar, a report card, uh, means of evaluating teachers, norms, <coughs> cultures, ways of being. Um, that, and that creates space for a lot of innovation. And it's also a recipe for imploding if you're not careful. So there's clear value and peril in the charter model by itself. On the other side, districts have the advantage of scale. So they, they don't need to wait until the fifth year to hire an art teacher. They're not having their kids cross Connecticut Avenue in order to use a neighborhood park. Um, but at, and they have report cards. Um, but at the same time, it can have a stultifying effect. You know, sometimes watching professional development unfold in DCPS, it was like a game of telephone. You know, so an idea that, that takes place in central office is then translated into PowerPoint slides that's sent to principals that then present those to their teacher. So there's, there's peril in that also. So I guess one of the questions for all of us is in what ways can districts better harness the creative, the regenerative power of charters, and in what ways can charters not have to reinvent every wheel and start to discover some advantages of scale without losing the autonomy that makes them what they are? Awesome. Well, that is a good, good uh, set of questions to jump off on with our other panelists. And I think, um, so let's start maybe with Abigail and work our way down this way. Um, can you respond, I mean, the, one of the promises of the school choice movement was that charter schools would be laboratories of innovation, sort of like Sam just said, that then districts could harness um, what charter schools learned, put that to use, and that that would, you know, that would create faster improvement sort of across the board. Can you talk about how, to what extent that has happened in D.C.? I mean, we're coming up on 20 years of the charter school movement here in the city. To what extent has that happened? Is that still a goal? And, and and how do we see that happening if it is? Um, first of all, for those of you who are standing in the back, <laughs> there are a number of seats up front. And I know no one likes to be in the first row, but please do feel free to come up. There are seats, and you might be more comfortable. Um, sorry, that's my, uh, I don't know. <laughs> I was going to say that, too. <laughs> um, so, so I think this question of the role of charter schools in um, in encouraging innovation within within traditional public schools um, and sharing of best practice, it's it's a good question, and I think that um, that there are examples sort of across the board on this. So in some ways, people might look at DCPS and say, well, DCPS hasn't fundamentally changed in every way, and we now have 44 percent of, of public school students in DC and charters. So obviously, the the part about charters affecting the system hasn't worked. On the other hand. Um, I can point to, and I'm sure Scott can chime in as well with this, a lot of specific examples of <coughs> charter schools and DCPS schools working together on, on 
a whole number of things in sort of a community of practice kind of approach. So in terms of, of curriculum and professional development, there's actually been, um, been a, a lot of that kind of interaction, which I think has been of value um, to, to, to both sectors. Um, even in terms of some of the, the actual curriculum programs, so, so the Common Core is, is, you know, from a standards perspective is one place that's happened, but even in terms of some specific curriculum programs, I was just reading a story today somewhere um, about how charter, some charter schools in addition to DCPS schools have adopted the Tools of the Mind curriculum at pre-K. Um, even as we also have a charter school network in DC that has its own pre-K curriculum that they have developed locally um, and have you know, begun to, to spread beyond that. So I think there are actually lots of examples at, at a school level where that has really happened. I also think that the sense of entrepreneurship that charters bring to the space really has um, infected in a good way DCPS. So part of that is around how you market your own school so when you have an all neighborhood school system where everyone just goes to school where they're assigned, you don't think about marketing your school in that way. Just that's, you know, our traditional systems didn't, didn't have to do that um, and didn't do that. Charters have done a really good job of that in many, many cases. And I actually think DCPS has learned a lot from that. How do we talk about what our school is, who our school is, what our sort of brand is, so that we can attract parents who are excited about what we have to offer at this particular DCPS school. And I think that's a positive thing, because even if it's parents who are assigned to that school and are going because it's their neighborhood school, there's a sense of, um, of investment and ownership that this is our school and this is how we define ourselves that I think is actually very valuable to a school community. Um, so those are, those are a few of the, of the things I think we've seen on that front. Laura, you have a different perspective as a, a parent. Um, well, I just sort of have a less informed perspective. I just, um, my son is now in his second year at a decent DCPS school, and we really love it. And when I interviewed f a bunch of people across the city for this article, my love kind of deepened because I realized, wow, we really have a good thing. My son loves his friends. He can read learning multiplication, and we pass 30 people we know on the four block walk to school every day. How could life be better? So, of course, the problem is that people leave this particular school, and there's this kind of insecurity that runs through the whole community that, well, if we stay, what if everyone else leaves, and what if we're the only people left? And you don't want to be left behind. It's sort of, it feels similar to applying for colleges in some insane way. So, this year, I I applied to two charter schools um, after doing a lot of thought about it. And then, unlike the other two years when I did the lottery, we actually got into our first choice charter school. And I was kind of horrified rather than being overjoyed. Um, so I have spent the last three weeks in this kind of lather of indecision. And um, I, was, I was talking to my son's DCPS um, teacher, who we're really close to and love and respect. And I kind of thought, and we only applied to language immersion schools. And another thing I was going to say about, well, anyway, um, that's for later. But I said, so, and I thought she'd say, oh, he'll be great. This is perfect. He loved Spanish is great. And instead she said, well, what school is? I've never heard of that school. And I said, oh, it's probably, it's, it's Mundo Verde, I'll just say. Um, I said, it's one of the better known schools in the city. And she said, oh, it's a charter? Oh, well, you shouldn't go there. They don't even train their teachers properly. And that was kind of the end of the discussion. Um, and so... And in a way, that did not, um, that did make me think. I mean, I think we are going to go, but I just thought, wow, these two communities. And I also interviewed a, um, an executive director of a very popular charter school about, and I mentioned that, you know, hey, my school's in the neighborhood about six blocks away. And she said, oh, your school, you like it there? How interesting, you know? And so I feel like there is a division between these two groups and that they're not going out for beer after work every night, <laughs> basically. Um, so that's. God, are they going up for beer? Well, I go out for a beer with the chancellor of DC Public Schools once a month. We make that a, we we have we don't go out for a beer, but we make it a point to have lunch once a month because there is so much opportunity to collaborate and and to respect the fact that yes, our schools are in some way in competition with each other, but we're also um, here to serve the entire city. And there's ways that we can do that at the granular level. For example 
Abby was referring to communities of practice. There's, there's, a, there's a group of schools that are working together to charter and DCPS working together um, to prepare for the Common Core and to think about how they can use the data from interim assessments that they get to inform their instruction and, and improve their instruction for the Common Core all the way up to, you know, if a school, if a charter school isn't succeeding in the charter environment, maybe it can succeed in a DC, DCPS environment or vice versa. Um, and then the collaboration on the common lottery this, this year, my school DC, where rather than having to apply to you know, dozens of individual lotteries um, and dozens of individual application processes, we put it all together into a single one where you ranked your schools and Finally, there was an opportunity where the preference of which school you preferred could have an impact on which school you got into. So there is, um, there is a lot of cooperation, and the cooperation is important because when you have a city that's almost 50% charter and 50% DCPS, if you don't do that, um, the result is fairly chaotic for the parents and families who are trying to navigate the system. So there's cooperation, but that's a little different than like lessons learned about pedagogy and, and teaching and learning in the classroom. And is that, are they, do you think that that's happening? I mean, is that still part of when you're looking at, you're about to tonight uh, think about um, or take applications for new charter schools here. And when you're thinking about sort of the community you're building, are you thinking about creating laboratories of innovation that then can produce lessons for other people to learn from? Or are you thinking about making schools that work for kids and, and, and not so much about the lessons that, you know, that can emanate from that school? Yeah, first and foremost, we're thinking about creating schools that work for kids. Um, the innovation side of charter schools has probably not fully lived up to its promise. I mean, you don't see these radical new approaches that are now sweeping the country. But, um, but, but there are several innovations, innovations that are being uh, tried and adopted at DCPS that it may be going too far to say charter schools invented them, but charter schools certainly um, were at the forefront of using them. So um, extended school day, extended school year, um, the use of, of blended learning. An, an example I'll give is that DCPS just recently um, uh, put out uh, an announcement advertising for a position of somebody who would be the, I, I think the term was the chief operating officer of a school. And the idea was that they were going to, this person was going to take all the administrative burden from the principal so that the principal could truly be the principal teacher, be focused exclusively on teaching and learning. That's a model that we see in many charter schools, uh, that, that bifurcation. You have an executive director and a principal. And so um, at that level of innovation, um, I think you're seeing charter schools uh, being pioneers and, and seeing that um, disseminate into the traditional public school system. Evelyn, is this even the right question to be asking about schools? <laughs> you know, I think it's an interesting question. I think from the perspective of accountability and revisiting the rationale for um, creating this system in the first place, I think it's appropriate. Um, I, I think that it needs to be more systematic um, you know, c capturing those innovations and capturing that value, and I don't see, uh, I don't see it happening in a very systematic way, and I certainly don't see it happening in a way that gets visibility to the end users, us, the parents. Um, it's interesting. I'm sitting. I was sitting here thinking. You know, I was thinking about Laura and about how she said some inconsistent things that I hear a lot. I love my neighborhood school, but I did enter the lottery and we are leaving. And I wish more people asked why. I wish we lived in a world where uh, the Lauras uh, and people like me who left their neighborhood school were actually interviewed and what we had to say about our experience was considered valuable from the perspective of you know, informing DCPS about how to be a better system. DCPS has a couple of advantages. They do have scale, they have a connection to neighborhood, and they have the ability, at least at present, to offer preschool to 12, end to end education that's predictable, that's high quality, 
for every single neighborhood. That, that was the proposition, that was the standard. And now I think we're backing into a situation where there is a disturbing amount of flexibility about what DCPS, DCPS is and does. But I think you cannot be, you know, Kmart and have Walmart move in two miles away and have the same price point and have the same goods on the shelf and expect to do the same things the same way and then, oh, you're shocked when half your customers have moved two miles away. I just think DCPS needs to, it's not even DCPS, it's really at a leadership level within the city, needs to decide what they want DCPS to be. Do we still want a preschool to 12 system of schools that is capable of being self-contained and self-sustaining? I think that's a fundamental question that gets danced around, we get stroked, we get reassured, but again, I see inconsistencies about where I think we're headed and the fundamental assumption that that's where we're headed. I spent the first 18 months of being active on education assuming that that was in place and unassailable, and I no longer assume that. You've given us a lot to, that, I, that I think we're going to touch on. But since you raised the question of why, Laura, can you talk a little bit about why you're... Well, in the, I mean, I think because everyone else leaves. And you don't want to be the one left holding the bag. I mean, but in our case, no one else is leaving. And that's what's made it really hard. Like, finally, I think our school has reached the turning point where people are staying. And now I'm probably the most involved on the PTA of anyone in our cohort. And yet they're staying. And I think I'm leaving. And, but that's, I mean, that's the imp because everyone lotteries, because that's what you're supposed to do. Because we have this lottery, and hey, SWS is down the street, don't you want to, you know, everyone is always kind of aspiring for the next great thing, even if it doesn't work for their kid. And it is, there is this element of peer, you know, insanity. That, I mean, that's the only reason I can, I mean, besides some issues with the principal, but, um, yeah. uh, <laughs> but really, it's like, you don't want to be the, you know, you don't, because that's what she talked to me about. Well, so that's this is no, why you can't really ask people in public. We lost <laughs> half our class last year, and that was fine. But what if you lose the other half? And what if there's a new group of kids every year? Then that defeats the purpose of the continuity of a neighborhood school. And that's also what happens when there are 18 schools within a one-mile radius of your house, which in my case is pretty much true. You know, I mean, there's just a lot of places you can go if you get in, which nobody does. So that's what I mean. Um, the mobility in D.C. is huge. It's really huge. So is right. that just a Shocking. consequence, like an unavoidable, inevitable consequence of school choice that we need to learn to sort of live with? And this is for Abby and, and Scott. I don't think it is, because when we look at our highest performing charter schools, one of the things we track very closely is their re-enrollment rate. And our highest performing charter schools have re-enrollment rates in the high 80s, you know, to, to low 90 percent, which is about the rate at which families are moving. So it's, I, don't, I don't believe it's inevitable, no. What about, and Abby, I know you're, you're, Abby is not the chancellor of D.C. Public Schools, but given that you're um, representing kind of the, the, the administration, what, what about DCPS? Is this a problem, I mean, that, that sort of churn, is that just an inevitable consequence for DCPS, for the neighborhood school system of, of having so much choice? Well, I think there's no question that the culture of, um, of school choice <laughs> and recognizing that that word choice is, is a loaded one for, for many, understandably. Um, but, but that culture, which is now absolutely pervasive in our city, I mean, we can't, can't deny it. So as you, know, as you pointed out at the beginning, Emma, we're not just talking about choice within, within charter schools, um, where 44% of our kids are. We've got kids who are going to schools in DCPS that aren't their neighborhood schools. We've got DCPS has selective high schools, and we've got a, a chunk of kids who choose at the high school level not to go to their neighborhood school. Um, not necessarily because their neighborhood school isn't, isn't good, but because they want something different and are willing to travel for that across the city. So, so there's an immense amount of that, and I do think that the mindset that that has put parents in of, of you know, it's not, you, sh you shouldn't just assume that your neighborhood school is going to work. You always should be asking yourself this question. I think that's what Laura's referring to. And I do think that that, that, that can be a little much. Um, and, you know, I, I've experienced as a parent, um, have been through various lotteries, both DCPS and public charter schools with my own kids. Um, and, 
and it does create some instability in school communities and I think a, a, a sort of um, transience among people who have options. I mean, you often have transience in cities among people who don't have good options and who are, you know, have trouble finding housing that they can afford and move around schools as a result of that. This is actually people at the other end of the spectrum, people who do have lots of options who are exercising them. Is that a bad thing? You know, I think there's some downsides to it for sure in terms of, of sustainability of programs and, and neighborhood stability and all of that. I think that there are a lot of positives, including the notion that until relatively recently, the only way you could access guaranteed quality was if you could afford to buy a house in a certain part of town, period. That's how it is in most places in our country still. And the notion that now in DC, both in DCPS and in public charter schools, there is the possibility that you can get around that limitation even if it's not a guarantee, for many, many, many people in the city, that opens a door that simply was not open for them. And I think that in the, in the discussion that you know, we're having right now around, around school boundaries and student assignment policy, we hear a lot from sort of the other end of the spectrum um, of people who currently have a guarantee of something that is really good and it's a right for them. And they're, of course, very, very happy with that and should be. And, um, and so as I say, there, there are pluses and minuses, but I, I think that understanding the complexity of that picture is just really, really important as we approach this. Um, there was a, I interviewed a mother recently for a story who said, you know, if there were fewer choices, if there were fewer escape hatches was the term she used, I think our neighborhood school would be stronger. And this was a woman who, like Laura, was, had just gotten into her dream charter school and was leaving her neighborhood school and felt very conflicted about it. Um, so it is, it is a tension, I think, that, that you are not alone in, in grappling with. Um, and Sam, Sam you, you wrote about this part of, of DC in your book about parents choosing and kind of the, um, you know, the sense that you're, you're out there choosing based on the information you have, but is it the information you need to make the right choice and how do you do that? And you wrote about that um, in a scene in your book in which a parent goes to a brand new, not even open school yet to consider it. Um, do you want to introduce that? And sure. So um, as I mentioned before, this, the book is primarily about um, educators and children at two schools, but it's also about two parents who are on the outside of either system uh, who are searching for a school for the first time. And so, um, so this scene is second half of the book, and really the only thing you know is this is one of the two parents. Her name is Karen Copeland. By the time Karen Copeland received the postcard in the mail saying her daughter had won a preschool seat at one of DC's newest charter schools, she had just about given up hope. Every other school had drawn Leah's name so far after the cutoff as to become comic. She hadn't even attended an open house for the school whose promise of admission she now held in her hand. But as she thumbed through her folder of handouts from the charter school expo, she started to remember being impressed by the school, Creative Minds International, and by its charismatic founding principle. She found the school's glossy handout. Opening, fall 2012, it read, alongside the color images of two children's faces. New, international, public charter school with arts, foreign languages, and hands-on project-based learning. Creative Minds International Public Charter School is a new tuition-free school for children in Washington, DC. Creative Minds International offers an engaging, diverse, international curriculum with project and arts-based activities that foster creativity, self-motivation, social and emotional development, as well as academic excellence. How can a school say it offers something, she thought, if it doesn't even exist? Then she read more about the school, IMAX in every classroom, an emphasis on the arts, and a founding principal with a PhD and a deep understanding of how children learn. And in spite of herself, Karen Copeland started to feel the fortune of her winning number. She also had no other options, a fact that tempered her enthusiasm when she attended a special open house for admitted families the following week. This is the actual reality of school choice, she told me as we entered the school's facilities to pick up Leah's enrollment pack. It's school chance. The most established charter schools have basically stopped being anything other than a true lottery ticket for families because most of the spots for the younger grades are taken by siblings. 
That means for those of us who still want to play the game, the best options are the unproven schools, the ones that sound great on paper and that may actually become great, but which don't yet exist in any real form. You're buying low and hoping the stock will jump. As Karen walked in the school's first year front doors, just off a busy stretch of 16th Street in Columbia Heights, she saw other families coming in to submit their enrollment materials. The foyer still featured the mottos and posters of the building's current tenant, a charter high school that was about to move across town. One set of parents brought their son with them. I don't like it, he said moments after entering, <laughs> at which point his father knelt down beside him. This isn't the school yet, he said. The boy stared back blankly. What is it then? <laughs> Nearby, another parent handed over her daughter's materials and gave the young female teacher on the other side of the table a bear hug. If you all need help getting ready for the fall, let me know. That gives me goosebumps, the teacher responded. I think I might cry. Karen moved through the entryway and into a large room where Creative Minds principal was addressing a semicircle of prospective families. I'm wondering how much balance you'll be able to maintain once the school year actually starts, Karen said, arms crossed. Leah's got 17 plus years of schooling ahead of her. I don't want her to get pushed too quickly into an academic focus. I know exactly what you mean, the principal responded. I started this school out of the same frustrations I'd felt when I was searching for a school for my son several years ago. That's why we want to make sure our teachers are just as focused on addressing the social and emotional needs of your children as they are on their academics. Karen watched the other parents around her nod in affirmation at what they heard. Are these future friends? Will Leah be spending time at these people's homes? Should I believe what this principal is telling me? We left shortly thereafter. Karen thumbed through the enrollment package outside the school's front doors. Request for records, race and ethnicity data collection, home language survey, emergency contact information, residency verification. I get excited every time I learn more about the school, she said. But at the same time, did you see how young those teachers were in there? I worry that what's happening is that the rising expectations of the parents and the increased understanding of the research has outstripped the ability of teachers to actually deliver the goods. Some of what I heard in there sounded like an election speech. It all sounds so good in theory, but what will it look like in practice? And do I want Leah to be part of the experiment? The more I think about it, Karen continued as new arrivals brushed past her, I'm not as concerned that they're a new school. It's preschool. By the time she gets to first grade, they'll have worked out the kinks. I go back and forth on where my priorities are. On one level, I say, let's try this, and I'm OK with her switching schools a few times. But I also can't help but think about the tumult down the line. It's a leap of faith, but I suppose that's true anywhere. She unlocked her car to drive back home, two miles to the east. I think we'll still move out of the city, she mused, just not right away. Thank you, Sam. So there's so much in there, and I just looked at the clock and want to have time for you guys to ask questions as well. Um, but I think I want to jump off from that into this question of, I mean, th there's so much risk taking, as you just said, for parents, especially with a new school, but really when just in choosing, I think, right, and in trying to make the right choice. I think that can feel like a risk to parents. Um, and the, you know, one of the one of the promises of of choice is equitable this equitable access to good schools um, or to quality schools. And so I'm wondering, um, and what is equitable access to good schools? And this is a question that's come up a lot with these student assignment uh, proposals. Like, what are we trying to achieve? What is equitable access? So Sam, I don't know if you want to take a stab at that and what you've seen through your reporting and through being a parent here like how do you how you how do you define that and are we on the track to that well so 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 the the title of the book is our school but the subtitle is searching for community in the era of choice and I hope that in that passage I read you hear some of the the tensions the possibilities and the redefinitions emerging so for me when I think about it um, so I've written about this in the past where I've said I support school choice, but it's complicated. Um, my son attends a charter school. I helped found a charter school. And unquestionably, charter schools unleash a unique kind of 
um, generative energy and really strong senses of community. It's a different sense of community. It's not neighborhood community. But there's real power in any organization where everybody, from the staff to the families, has opted in to something. And at the same time, you hear Karen's own ambivalence in the fact that there's a sense of, well, all right, I got the winning number, so I'll do this for a little bit, but I don't know that I'm actually investing in it for the long haul. I might just kind of dip my toe in it. And then as she says, we might not still stay in the city. And, and I think if we think about questions of equity, one of the things we have to wrestle with is, you know, to what extent are we in DCPS and in the charter school community really explicitly wrestling with the, the, the historic tension in our country, which is the balance between the me and the we. So it, clearly, the my child, my choice mantra has a lot of cachet and really speaks to the me. And in a country that's founded on these dual principles of liberty equality, um, I think we all know that we tend to err on the side of liberty and not on equality. So how can school choice also lead us back to a deeper commitment to the we? Even if the we is, in charter schools and in DCPS, starting to take a different form than the traditional neighborhood school. That's, that's an unresolved tension. It's one of the ones I hope we'll explore. But you know, as I've said before, the thing about democracy is it, um, it doesn't require that we live in equality. Um, but it does require that we share pretty significantly in a common life. And I think one of the most interesting unresolved questions here in DC is to what extent is school choice in DC bringing us closer to and or farther away from really sharing in a common life in ways that will improve other aspects of um, our lives, our social fabric, and our communities. So that, that, that notion of a common life can be expressed in different ways. So does, does creating a community mean that you're going to school with the same people who live within 10 blocks of you? Or does it mean that you're going to school with people who live all over the city? So that you're actually creating a community of the, the District of Columbia, all eight boards. Um, I'm going to actually um, pass out a a map that we do, we do this for each school. We show the school and then we put a dot for where every student lives. And, and you can, um, thank you Emma. You know, you can see, this is for Mundo Verde, which was the school that was, that was uh, covered in Sam's book. Um, and you can just see that this is a school. Yes, there is a cluster near the school, but it's serving the entire city. And isn't there a value, certainly post Brown versus Board of Education, isn't there a, maybe even a higher value for a community that embraces the entire city across socioeconomic, regional, racial um, boundaries? Evelyn, can you, can you talk about your experience in your neighborhood and how you, you, know, how you view this question through the lens of, of your own experience? Well, my neighborhood school is Garrison, and I've spent a tremendous amount of time and energy trying to support the school, even though we left the school after my daughter was in preschool because she got a spot in the school that my son was in that he had been placed in administratively by DCPS. Um, you know, Garrison is a school that has kids from all eight wards as well. I think it's a misperception that neighborhood schools only serve the kids in their neighborhoods. It's just not true. Um, that, that half of the DCPS student body that does not attend its in-boundary school is going somewhere uh, to some other DCPS school. So I think increasingly uh, schools are, are a reflection of the city. I think what's getting lost is the value of the neighborhood school for those of us who are interested in, in bringing our neighborhoods together. I live in, a, in Logan Circle, which is an extremely rapidly gentrifying area. And there's a perception that, you know, schools exist along the poles. So you're either in Ward 3 in an affluent, you know, mostly white area, 
or you're in Ward 7, 8, and some other areas of the city that are unfortunately, you know, socioeconomically and racially segregated. But then you've got a whole other swath of the city that is changing really quickly and doesn't really, without a neighborhood school, has no way of knitting together the disparate people who are now part of that community physically. Um, the fact that on average students go to 64 different schools I think is damaging to physical neighborhoods. Neighborhoods as, as distinct from communities. Communities are places where people share common interests. Neighborhoods are places where people share common interests and are likely to run into each other, you know, uh, face to face. So I really, again, I, what I ponder and what I try to notice is what is it that's getting plugged? What is it that's getting sold to us? Is it this concept of uh, sort of a utopian sense that schools can have it all? They can be democratic, they can be diverse, they can be high quality, uh, and we don't have to sacrifice anything. Well, it's, it's not true. I feel what we're sacrificing is that neighborhood component. <coughs> And because the neighborhoods that really, really value their schools are ones that are affluent and have that end-to-end -end preschool to 12, um, you know, privilege of, of having great schools that, that they do want to hold on to and that they do want to send their kids to, ignores the fact that there are areas of the city that very much want to recreate uh, a, um, a system of community schools to serve their community where it does not currently exist. So I think charters are a good way of bridging the gap. I think they're necessary. I appreciate them. Um, I think it would be uh, very difficult for families if charters and quality DCPS schools did not exist somewhere in the city. But what concerns me is this notion that neighborhood schools are almost bad now. It's almost a negative to be and want to be a neighborhood school. And I find a, um, a lot of resistance on the part of DCPS. To, to being more um, customer friendly, I guess. You know, it's interesting to think that teachers are expected to differentiate instruction, but principals I don't think are expected to differentiate <laughs> engagement based on what their neighborhoods need from them in order to feel confident and interested in that school and to see their future tied up with that school. And I'm not sure why that is, but it could be that there is just a notion that, you know, we're throwing up our hands and we're so afraid of this idea that zip code equals destiny when 75% of the students in our public school system have already escaped their, dis their, their zip code somehow, one way or another. So I'm just, I spend a lot of time trying to read the tea leaves because <laughs> I just feel like there's no declared, um, there's no declared destination for us as a school system. Mm -hmm. <coughs> it takes us to the edge of questions about the um, <coughs> school assignment proposals, which we will do in a minute. But I want to hear from Laura about how the c notions of community and neighborhood play into your decision and, and into the, thoughts and sort of perceptions of the parents you've talked to in your reporting on this? Well, our school is, is a bit different because there's, there's a very overt conflict between the, the gentrifying immediate neighbors and people who used to live in the neighborhood who still send their kids to school, some of whom don't live in the district, which is a frequent subject of discussion. But that's what the <laughs> tension between the parents and the principal, and it's like kind of unpleasant. After, you know, I, I'm like, I just want to drop my kid off at school. I don't want to get involved. This is a little heady, you know, for 8, 12 in the morning. Um, but that's, um, but we also feel like, I mean, one reason we are leaving is because we feel like we already have the community of our neighborhood, both our neighbors who don't go to our school because we um, live near a popular charter and half of my neighborhood goes to this charter. And it is sort of like, it feels like a neighborhood school. Um, 
And because we already know them, we already have the relationships, it's not the same as seeing people every day. But so why not try to do something that you might think is better for your kid? And that is the, the conflict between, you know, like, yeah, I would like to stay and make this school better, but there are these barriers that y you can't, you know, that I don't ha personally have the energy to confront. I just kind of want my kid to get a good education, and, and that does contribute greatly to the problem. I understand that, but, you know, um, there are these things in neighborhood schools in D.C. in 2014 that are, you know, difficult mm -hmm. as a parent. I mean, I, you know, that there, and that they're very an exaggerated in our particular uh -huh. school, I feel like. Uh -huh. I don't think that's as, an, as uncommon, though. I really don't think that right. that dynamic of, you know, new parents, you get labeled, you're a new parent because you're not a legacy part of, of, of DCPS population that's been um, served for the past decades. So even though I've been here for three decades, I'm a new parent. Um, which is kind of interesting. Right, because your uncle didn't go to the same school. Your grand I mean, that's how it is in our school. It's like well, you know, increasingly I find that it's actually, it's, it's not so much that as it is that I have different expectations. I have an expectation of being involved in school governance. So when I got to Garrison and there had been no PTA for the past seven years, um, even before I went to Garrison, I supported the woman who restarted the PTA there and was sort of a shadow vice president because I'd do whatever she needed me to do. The um, um, local school advisory team is actually, the more, un the more stressed a school is, the less likely it seems that's actually uh, to be functional and have meaningful, be, represent meaningful opportunities for input. Um, they're just expectations that I think new parents have that are annoying and resisted by certain principals and certain teachers, and it turns a lot of parents off. Scott, did you want to jump in? Well, it, it, I think Sam's book um, very well illustrates just how hard it is at a traditional DCPS system to, to change the culture. And to, I mean, the focus there is, is more less on the parents and more on the teachers. You know, that you've got a principal and you've got a leadership um, that really wants to shift the way instruction is done. And you have a few teachers that are on board, but there's a sea of teachers that aren't. And, and so it's, it's just, it's harder to change. And, and I, Sam opened the discussion by talking about how, you know, DCPS and charters each have something they can, they can benefit from the other. You know, charters can benefit from scale and DCPS can benefit from, um, the innovation and the, the um, nimbleness. Um, but you know, it strikes me that it's, it's easier for charters to fill, that, to fill their gap. They can, you know, we have groups now like EdOps that does all the back office for a charter, so they don't need to build that scale. We have charter management organizations that provide all sorts of things. We have the special ed cooperative that allows charters to pool their special ed resources. That, that's an easier thing to fix than to you know, than to move um, a, an entrenched culture. And it's, it's really hard work, and I have tremendous admiration for the, for the progress they've made at DCPS to, to move as far as they have. Abby, before we go to questions in a couple minutes, I do want to ask you to talk a little bit about the, these proposals that you've, you and your team and, and the committee that Evelyn is on have put forth. Um, so here we are 60 years after Brown v. Board of Education. We still live in a city that, while gentrifying quickly, um, many of our schools are still very segregated, and many of our neighborhoods are still very segregated uh, by race and by class. And so I'm wondering to what extent you see choice as a way to, to, to help integrate our schools, and to what extent you see choice as a way to help improve the quality of schools, or how you think about the role of choice as you are trying to, do, to you know, design a framework that's going to improve schools um, in the coming decades. Yep. Um, so I think that the, the you, you, you touched on a number of themes that intersect in, in all this. So one is just school quality generally, where, Although people define school quality in different ways, and one parent might 
think one school is a terrific school and another parent might feel differently about it. Um, however we all define it, there's I think general agreement as a city that not all of our schools are at the level of quality that, that all parents are satisfied with the schools that they have you know, certainly a right to or, or access to. Um, and, and at the same time, this issue, these issues of race and class that, that you point out, Emma, um, you know, in some way, and, and this morning a number of us were at the groundbreaking for Mundo Verde's new building. Um, that is, groundbreaking is a misnomer because the construction was well underway. But, uh, and it is directly across the street from two schools that, that sit right next to each other. And you think there are two schools there, one across the street, one a block away, M.M. Washington that has since closed, Dunbar two blocks away. And why are there all these schools there? Well, when you look at those two that are right next to each other across the street, there's an African-American school and a white school. And you see this all across the city, right? Still, like the most, you know, usually at least one of the buildings is, is no longer operating as a school. Um, but we have all of these markers of the pre-Brown v. Board past in, in the city. Um, and yet, today, there are many, many schools that we could walk into in this city today that are 100% uh, African American, um, you know, zero kids that are not black in that school. Latino, white, Asian, you know, it, it is a, a single race school, and some of those schools are very high performing schools. So they are serving their kids very well on many fronts, and kids are going to college and are set up to succeed in life. Um, and some of those schools are not seeing those kinds of outcomes with kids and are arguably not setting their kids on, on a path that is likely to, you know, to set them up for success. So is race the, the differentiating factor there? No, we actually have more than one. I and mean, we've got you know, a bunch of examples where, where it's working. And, um, and so you know, we're, we're in a different place in some ways than 1954. Um, the, you know, the resources that go to schools, the beautiful school buildings that are serving kids of all races, all of that kind of stuff, it, it is different. We have made a lot of progress, I think we can, we can confidently say. And at the same time, I do think it is worth asking ourselves this question of whether we think it is a good goal for us as a city to have more diversity across our schools. And if so, how do we get there? So choice is one way that, you, that people can opt into schools that, that look more diverse. And we do have schools, both DCPS and charter schools, it tends to be schools that are more clustered in the middle of the city where our housing is more diverse. But we do have schools that are very diverse, both racially and socioeconomically. As a parent, I, I think that's a very good thing. So that's something that you know, I think for my own children is, just, is something that I value highly. Some parents will value it more highly than others. Um, is it, as a city, you know, by definition, a good thing? Like, is it something that we as a city and, and as a government should be designing things around? You know, I think that's a much more complicated question. So I can say what I value as a parent, and I'm seeking that out. You know, I'm not sure that, you know, that saying that choice in order to, to drive diversity as a value over the kind of predictability or, or neighborhood focus that Evelyn has talked about, you know, whether I can say that as a city that is the value we should drive over the other. So, I mean, I know that I've answered that sort of as clear as mud, but, but, but I think it's because this stuff is really complicated. And I, and I think the most important thing is that we address these kinds of issues head on and, and talk about how complicated it is and figure out whether there are ways. I mean, we're not, the choice genie is not going back in the bottle. You know, like, like I think whether we want it to or not, it's not going to. It, it is, it, this is the culture of certainly our city at this point. And so the question is, how can we use it in ways that we think get us towards the kind of quality that we want for everybody and the kind of equity of access that we want for everybody. And I think there are myriad different combinations of policies that can help move us towards that. There's no one silver bullet. Um, but I challenge us to ask that question and, and to be open to a range of ways that we can get there. But what about the question Evelyn asked, which was, what about the people who would love to have the predictability and the Everybody sort of has predictability right now. No, 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 but the predictability of a good school, but they just, they, 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 ha they choose now. We, we have so much choice now and so many people not going to where they're assigned because their schools kind of 
don't live up to what they, what they want. But they would really like that school too. So how do you like tease apart those questions of would you put your energy into channeling the choice or do you put your energy into like figuring out whether to you know, make schools across the city for every kid? better well I mean in my view you got to do both and and I don't I don't really see any way around that so should we be working to improve every school in the city working really hard and really smart yes absolutely and I I, I, I believe we are um, at the school level at the district level at the city level I really do believe that that work is happening um, we're making some mistakes and missteps along the way for sure but I, I, I see the progress and that work has to happen um, at the same time, because we have created this environment of choice, people are going to value different things differently. So, you know, if what is most important to someone is predictability, well, everybody has that, right? Everybody has a school of right that you can know that you're going. Now, we may be shifting some of those boundaries. I'll grant you that. But, <laughs> um, but you know, everyone's got that right now. And, and People are happy with it to different degrees and at different points. And I, I would also, you know, even within charters, I mean, Scott's right that you look at re-enrollment rates and they're pretty high um, at, at most of, of the, certainly the high-performing charters. However, if you look at in, in my school, D.C., you know, which the, the common ladder we just did, there's still lots of people who are trying their odds, even from some of those high-performing charters and saying, well, I'm just going to throw my hat in again this year in the lottery. It's like, it, I mean, it, it is, you know, I think what Laura talked about in her article is true. There's a lot of just kind of shopping around because of that culture. And, you know, you can't, you can't fault parents for always asking themselves, am I doing the best I can by my kid, right? Like, that's what we're supposed to do as parents. Now, it can make us a little bit crazy um, if you know you you sort of get caught up in this choice environment and different people choose to do it to different degrees. But I think part of this is that it's the, what you said about expectations, Evelyn. Is you know if we each if we all are ratcheting up our own expectations, um, to some degree we're setting up all of our schools for failure, right? Because you're always thinking, well, this other school does this particular thing better than this school, right? It's just this constant one, one up and that's, so, that's just life. You're never gonna have cookie cutter, exact quality, the same everywhere. Um, so the question is, are there ways to, to get people to invest in their communities, however they define that, so that all of our schools can get better? And some people are gonna invest geographically, some people are gonna invest you know, in, in opting into uh, communities in different ways. Right, on that note, I'd um, love to open it to you guys for questions. And there's a microphone coming around, so if you've got a question to ask, just give a raise of the hand. How about in the blue in the front? And yeah. one last thing, before you take questions, this is a, a topic on which soapboxing is really easy. If you <laughs> have a question, I'll hand over the mic, but if there, if you start wandering beyond question into commentary, I may come back and just take it from you. Right. <laughs> Thank you, Connor. <laughs> so I think there's a hand in the blue shirt in the front. Hi there. Um, I'm Kelly Field. I'm actually a higher ed reporter. So I'm educating myself on these K-12 issues as a DC public school parent or a prospective parent. Um, and I was wondering if the goal is to increase equity and diversity, to what degree and what evidence is there that the choice sets will accomplish that? Um, you know, given that some of the, the wards are very um, undiverse, as you mentioned, some are more diverse, how will sending kids to other schools within their ward affect um, the goals that we're trying to achieve? Um, so I assume that's for me. Yeah. Um, so, so the policy that, um, Kelly, did you say is that, was that your name? That Kelly was referring to is one of the. So what what we've done at this point with the work of the advisory committee is we've we've put out a whole set of of policy examples we're calling, but they include lots of of individual policies that can build up into a student assignment policy um, to start engaging the community in some of the different kinds of options that we could we could look at. So one is this notion of what we're calling choice sets at the elementary school level, and the idea is that rather than have a school boundary for a single elementary school, you would have a larger school boundary that encompasses multiple elementary schools, and then you would have a, a way of accessing 
So you'd have a right to one of those schools within your choice set, but not necessarily any, any particular one. Um, and, and there's been a lot of discussion around, well, what does choice sets add to this? And, and it's one that I think has been, I'd say, of, of the whole range of things, probably the hardest for people to wrap their minds around. What, what would be the advantage of that? I think that the, the notion, in some ways, is to try and balance this piece around um, close to home access um, and building community you know, close to home with the opportunity to exercise some choice. So essentially, what it would do is it would give families that are relatively close to a school a, a higher likelihood of being able to access a school that might not be the one that's closest to them, but that they're particularly interested in without having to travel across the city. So it probably works most effectively in situations where that cluster of schools might include a school that's got some kind of specialized program, you know, like an IB program or, you know, a, a STEM program in a school that, that, um, that a parent is particularly interested in accessing, but then has a, a likelier chance of getting there. Um, if you've got three schools that are very similar, racially, socioeconomically, in terms of student performance, and they're in the choice set, then it's given you, you know, some variety of location. You might, there might be something you like about the school that's, um, that's different. But if in those ways the choice set is very similar, you're right. It doesn't really, you know, add anything there. Yeah. But just, just one uh, point about equity versus diversity. We just looked at um, the performance of the DC charter schools um, by how socioeconomically diverse they are. And what's interesting is, is that there's a, there's a, the, the, the highly diverse schools do pretty well with uh, education, with economically disadvantaged students. But there's a cluster of schools, five or six charter schools, that do exceptionally well with um, low income students. And they are almost all exclusively serving low-income students. They, they appear to have cracked the code to produce these um, actually achievement gap closing results. And they're not doing it in a diverse setting. They're doing it in, um, in what we would call a segregated setting. So can I just, you know, what this doesn't get to is quality. I mean, I'm, I was itching to respond to Abby's uh, earlier comment about predictability. Yes, predictability is great, but only if you like what you predictably will get. And that's what I don't find enough focus on. That's what I find not enough attention is paid to. I wish there were panels across the city at think tanks and foundations and all kinds of smart people came together on a daily basis to try to figure out how to improve quality in every neighborhood because as Scott just pointed out, there's no one recipe for achieving quality. There are schools that are 60% female. You know, it's kind of like reading the Bible. Depending on what you believe, you can find almost anything that can be, you know, you can point to a verse that justifies what you believe. Um, so I could make an argument for same gender education based on the success of some schools. Uh, Cleveland Elementary, near where I live, is mostly African American, not terribly diverse. Banneker High School, not terribly diverse, both African American and predominantly female, but knocking it out of the park. Um, I think parents are pretty flexible about diversity, actually. It's not, a, it's not the trump card for us. I think quality, and then we want to be able to lock it in. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's what I find a lot of dancing around. I, I, you know, it's like, yes, DCPS is doing it, they've made great progress, but what else do we need to do to really make it happen? And I don't see enough, I don't hear enough discussion about that question. The role of choice is not the question for DC public schools. It's how do we make sure that the underlying legacy system actually functions as it should, so that choice can do its job. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so I just want to, and Evelyn and I have had this conversation before, as you might imagine. Um, uh, but now we'll have it in front of all of you. Um, so so I, think, I think that's absolutely right. And the, the work is improving the quality at all schools. And at the same time, I think it is important that we also have a student assignment policy and process that is workable, 
Um, there's all, I mean, I'm not getting into like all of the sort of technical issues with our current boundaries and feeders because that's a whole other thing, but that's workable and that's fair. And with the goal that quality across the board absolutely is where we, we <coughs> need to be and, and, and I do believe are working hard to get there and I think there are actually lots of conversations in think tanks and elsewhere a, a, about it. Um, but, but in the meantime, um, without the magic wand to get to 100% fabulous quality, you know, everywhere, um, we need to have systems that are both, you know, workable and sort of technically manageable, but also um, are as fair as as we can can have. Let's take another question about you. Hi, <coughs> my name is Rob Lippincott. I work for a company called I2 Capital Group, which I2 means impact investing, and a lot of the discussions we're having are where private investors would like to improve school, would like to improve education, and they want to put their money to work somehow, but they don't want to be philanthropists uh, or to sort of second guess taxation. They want to invest in something that's going to be positive. Help me understand where private investment could help. What's the most positive role of private investment in schools, especially to, pr to promote the power of choice? Who wants to take that, Sam? I'll start. So. Um, to me, uh, there are th the two things that are most important to crack in schools are um, finding better ways to recruit, retain, support, evaluate, and, um, and equitably distribute high quality teachers. And that's not what I'm going to say to invest your money in, although that's important. And the second is um, cracking the code of assessment. So. Right now, we still, to a large degree, pretend that we can speak intelligently about which schools are successful and which are unsuccessful based on reading and math scores, which are valuable and overvalued. So I'm an educator and also an MBA, and the most valuable thing I learned in business school, which the private sector has been doing for a while, was the innovation of the balanced scorecard and the idea that Companies figured out a while ago that if we're only looking at net profit, eh, we might be in trouble. So what is surprising to me that hasn't yet really taken form in any way is um, a framework, a tool, an instrument that helps people better quantitatively represent the largely qualitative and nonlinear aspects of teaching and learning. There are individual schools that have done it, that I've written about elsewhere, and we don't have enough time to talk about it now. But so there's already a lot of individual site innovation that's happening. But what would be really exciting to me as somebody who writes about schools um, to see would be somebody that really helps schools, because so much of what is happening, whether you're at the district level or certainly at the charter level, is you, you see these ideas of what you want to do. But frankly, you need somebody else to get you almost all the way there. And then you can just plug in your best wisdom and observation into something that isn't just potentially down the line for purposes of more intelligent accountability, but is fundamentally about diagnostic quality improvement so that we can better improve what we're doing. And I don't know why that hasn't happened yet, <laughs> uh, but to me, that's a great opportunity um, for private dollars. Say qua meter. <laughs> so, yeah. with, uh, with all modesty, I think we have built a balanced scorecard um, for charter schools in Washington, D.C. It's called the Performance Management Framework. It looks at growth, proficiency, uh, re enrollment rate, attendance, college acceptance rate, graduation, SAT, ninth grade on track. I mean, it looks at a lot and it condenses it down to a single score. And this book that we left on the chair um, shows you the score for each of those schools. If, if I were investing, I would, I would focus on education technology. We've talked at, on this panel about just how difficult it is for teachers to differentiate, and yet that is the expectation. And I, I think we're in the, you know, the second inning at best of the promise of this technology, not to replace teachers, but to enable them to serve all students. So I just want to ask Laura real quick if, if she agrees that the, P, not to put you on the spot, that the PMF, the Performance Management Framework, or the Tier 1, 2, 3 system for charter schools, whether that works for you as a parent, as a sort of gauge of what's, what's a good school? I mean, I, I have no idea. I, one of the two um, 
charter schools I applied to after applying, because I am not a great researcher except for, <laughs> for work, uh, I was like, oh, God, it's tier two. Well, forget it. I won't go there. <coughs> Uh, which, like, I don't, I, I have no real sense as a parent of what that entails. That sounds compelling, but that <laughs> doesn't sound like a lot of categories. I mean, three. There's only three categories. I so I don't know well, whether we, that would. Well, we score them from zero to a hundred, and then for people who have trouble with that, we put them into three categories. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I think a lot of people might. I mean, uh, yeah. It's, <laughs> Sam, you want to tell yeah, I just want to say real quick, I think, uh, I think Scott is partly right, and we've t talked about this publicly. I think there, there is some real positive movement made of taking some important existing data points like re-enrollment rates um, and using them more in concert. But here's the biggest issue, right? So one of the other big paradigm shifts, where's my phone, right? This, this, this has changed everything about education. And, and let me sum it up this way. It used to be that content was seen as the end goal of schooling. Now, content knowledge, when we do it right, is merely the means by which we reach the end goal, which is a set of skills, habits, and dispositions that can guide young people through life. I think Scott would agree we have not yet cracked the code of helping, helping put together a framework that is partially painted enough to be useful and to steer people towards some, um, something that they can plug themselves into, but that is fundamentally about evaluating schools based on the extent to which they are measurably helping young people acquire those skills. And that, to me, is where the innovation still has to happen. And one thing I will say is the great schools, I have no dog in the fight or anything, but I find it, uh, which I know is a privately run company, I find it to be like completely random and to not have much bearing on what parents I know, what I think. You know, it like, it's like a Yelp review assessment of schools, which unfortunately Yelp is taking over the world, but I don't think that that is helpful because it just doesn't seem to have much of a correlation between what schools are actually doing and what kids are learning there and how parents feel about them. So that was We, we actually had this discussion with great schools because they rated one of our tier three lowest schools, they rated it, I think, an eight or something. And we said, you're, you know, this is A, it's wrong, and B, you're confusing people. So, so, they built into, <laughs> so they built into their algorithm that if we rate it a, a, a tier three, they wouldn't give it a score of over a six. Which is pretty, <laughs> pretty yeah, pretty, pretty random. Pretty that's, yeah. That's yeah. Interesting. So there's an area to explore, clearly, <laughs> <laughs> for investment. Other questions? Um, how about over here in the middle? Hi, my name is Rachel Venezia. I'm a current DCPS teacher and formerly worked in education policy. Um, one of the biggest critiques I heard um, when I was in policy regarding charter schools was that they would cream the DC or uh, the public schools in the area, taking um, you know the the parents who tend to be most highly motivated, who often have high performing students, um, are the ones who, in some cases, tend to go to these charter schools. But in DC, um, we have a lot of schools who, like KIPP, actively recruit in these low, low SDS areas. Um, and as we've seen an increase in charter schools, we've seen um, an increase in test scores on the DC CAS. To what extent do you think, um, and this question is um, mainly for, I'd like to hear from Ms. Smith and Mr. Pearson, to what extent do you think that competition from the charter schools is driving um, this improvement in DCPS schools? And are we going to see a leveling off of parents and students deciding to leave their neighborhood schools for charter schools as the improvement continues in DCPS? So that was a lot, a lot of questions in one. I'll take a <laughs> crack at some of this. Um, so, so one, one of the things that I think is important to note in DC now is for, for many years, the total pie of students um, of public school students was was not increasing, and basically what was happening was the there was a shift between from DCPS, DCPS enrollment was going down, and charters enrollment was going up, or it would look different from the direction that you are. Um, uh, <laughs> that has changed in the last couple of years, and I think that's a very significant um, data point. So both public charter schools and DCPS 
are increasing their enrollment. So the total pie is getting bigger. Um, charters are not in, increasing at the expense of DCPS. Um, I think that's I think that's um, you know important and notable. And because I think that at the end of the day, um, the the single biggest proxy for you know how people feel about the schools is what I mean, parents voting with their feet, right? Um, so as schools improve on on all sides, um, I think parents will choose to stay in schools that they feel good about. Um, Scott has done a really good job at the Public Charter School Board of identifying public charter schools that are not delivering for kids and um, phasing them out in various ways. So um, I think that's important too, that, you know, that it's not just, um, you know, that the, the quality focus is, is across the board. Um, I lost the other piece. Did charter, have charters spurred improvement? Ah, so I think that, um, there are a whole bunch of different factors that have spurred in improvement in DCPS. Um, so it is, I think, good news for the city that as charter schools, you know, scores are going up, so are, so are DCPSs, um, the enrollment piece as, as a proxy as well. I certainly think that some of what we talked about in terms of the environment that charters have created, I do think that has helped in terms of, you know, from a culture perspective in terms of DCPS. Um, I also think there are a lot of very specific things the DCPS has done that you know may well have been totally independent of, of charters. Um, I do think that one thing that is it was in the beginning of your question. We have a lot of charter schools that are serving lots of of low income kids, as you mentioned and as Scott talked about earlier. We still do have a situation where at the extremes, um, DCPS is still running the schools that have the very highest concentration of at-risk students and the very lowest concentration of at-risk students. So if you look at the tails, um, it is largely DCPS serving the tails. Um, you know, there are lots of different reasons, I think, that, that are, are potentially behind that. Um, but I think it's just another piece of this picture to look at. Scott, did you want to add anything? Yeah, um, Charter, certainly demographically, there's no evidence that charter schools are, um, are skimming. Uh, charter schools serve higher percentages of low-income students, higher percentages of African-American students, and now serve essentially the same percentage of special education students um, and achieve higher results. But I, I would concede that there is probably a psychographic benefit that many charter schools get because people have chosen to be there. And so there's something, somebody in that family cared enough to send their students there. Uh, we have a few schools who very self-consciously target the most at-risk, challenging students, students who've been incarcerated, students who are in foster care, students who um, have dropped out of school. So that may counterbalance that to some extent, but, but I, um, I think it's, it's a complicated picture, and, and um, by no means are charter schools serving a privileged population. So it's, it's a little after 5.30, and we need to wrap it up, but I want to ask the other three panelists who didn't just speak if you have anything burning that you want to leave the audience with or get off your chest before we <laughs> say goodbye. I, I will cede my time if there's someone out there that has a burning question. <laughs> How about the hand <laughs> behind you? Oh. It is burning, I promise. Um, so my name is Joseph Quinn, and I actually teach at a Choice uh, Blue Ribbon School in D.C. Um, and uh, we, I guess my concern with the, the point that you just, you just proposed is that we do effectively do that. I know that uh, about 30% of the freshman students every year are uninvited because they don't reach the standards of, of the 2.0 minimum that the school expects Which or maintains. Um, I would not maybe like to mention the school's name is it specifically. A it is in DCPS, um, but I also have um, co co-workers who have worked at so KIPP, who worked other yes, examination entries. Yes, yes. So which charters don't have, but there right. are. But I am familiar with with logistically how some charters work with students that are are if students don't fit into or incorporate into certain charters' cultures. I know st teachers that work at charter schools such as KIPP and other institutions in DC that are deemed highly effective uh, that um, remove students who don't incorporate into the culture well who might not be performing well. And their numbers, the numbers that they post their sophomore year during the DC CAS actually demonstrate students that might have been, not doesn't, don't demonstrate the population that the school received 
based on actual lottery numbers. So I guess my question for you is this, should the, um, should, how can we address that issue, if that is an issue? How can we uh, look at numbers and make them more comparable, more equitable, so that we can actually make sure that uh, charters and, and DC public schools are able to um, compare themselves in a way that's measurable, in a way that's, that's very, very meaningful for both of those, those communities? Or is that not necessary, I guess, and should charters attempt to work with students that are best for their communities because it's serving those students best? Um, let, uh, let me turn on a couple, couple points there. So, so one is uh, the, the notion of schools of any type um, sort of, you know, counseling kids out or somehow, you know, repelling certain kids. Uh, and and I, I think there are probably examples of, well, you talk about example of that in a DCPS school. There may be examples of it in charter schools. I mean, it, it may be very school specific. I think the DCPS and public charter schools did a really important thing this year in coming together around something that we call the equity reports, um, which PCSB was very involved in. Um, and among the things that it looks at is what the change is over the course of a school year in terms of kids coming in or coming out of a school. And one of the things that, that you know, I think is, um, that what, I mean, th what, what I think is so valuable about the equity reports is you can now see that data for every school in the city and you can compare it across the board. And you can take away a lot of different things from it. So, you know, and, and some of them are maybe evident in looking at the data and some of it you'd have to dig into. But there's a transparency around it that I think is really, really important. Um, and while it is true that as a general rule, as a sector, DCPS tends to pick up kids during the year and, and public charter schools tend to lose as a sector during the year. I think that those changes are not quite as dramatic as some people would suggest they are. And you can actually look at the data on a school by school basis. Um, another thing that we've done that I think is important in terms of, of being clear that everybody should be playing by the same rules is my school DC, this common uh, application and lottery that we put in place this year, which is in part intended to take out of the hands of schools, both DCPS and public charter schools, the sort of intake and, and you know, sorting that, that some schools are accused of at the intake level. So schools that are supposed to be accepting by a random lottery, we have now taken that lottery centrally and are doing an audit of the data so that if something like what you just described where it doesn't look like the people on the roster were really the people who were accepted in a lottery, that is something that will be you know, evident to, to everyone. Um, and almost every charter school signed up for My School DC, understanding that that was part of the deal. And I think part of the, the reason for that is that almost every charter school has been playing by those rules. And to the extent that there have been some bad actors, it will be easy to identify them um, through this process. But I, I think that the fact that so many people stepped up to the plate would suggest that most of them were probably playing by the rules all along. On, on that note, I think I mean, it's so clear that we've just begun to scratch the surface of all of the issues and questions and unresolved kind of um, issues that we have around these, uh, around school choice and around making better schools in DC. So uh, thank you for coming to begin the conversation. And uh, Connor, do you have anything you need to say? All right, thanks so much for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.